The internet is great, but it's far from perfect. Packets get lost, corrupted, delayed, or arrive out of order. So how is it possible that with a few lines of code, I can start a server, and whether it's running locally or in a machine across oceans and continents, I'm able to send data and be sure that it will arrive reliably and in the intended order? Well, it's possible thanks to TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. And what we just demonstrated was a simple a TCP server, but HTTP is built on top of TCP. SMTP, which is responsible for email, is built on top of TCP. And what these do is that under the hood, they are simply TCP connections, so they send and receive data. But depending on semantics, so when you access a website using HTTP, you're actually asking for a certain web page, and then the server gets that TCP message, does some processing, looks up the HTML, or generates it, maybe puts in some data specific to you that it got from the database and then it sends that html or javascript back so under the hood it's relying on tcp so how does tcp do it well thankfully i was running a program called tcp dump which allows us to dump and monitor the content of the tcp segment this is listening to tcp port 8080 which was used by the server and it's writing the packets to tcpcopter.pcap file and we can use a program called Wireshark to look at that file but before we, we do that let's take a look at the basic uh, TCP primitives offered by C and actually by the operating system and used by all the programming languages to establish TCP connections. So you create a socket, and this is basically an endpoint uh, uh, that can be attached to the port and the server uses to interact with the TCP. Then we bind to this port. So binding is basically attaching the port and the port is the address of the process within the machine. So uh, a machine has an IP and a machine has multiple processes and each one of these can have uh, an IP address exposed to the world. So when you send a request to some server, some HTTP server or email server, you're actually accessing a port within an IP address. And then you start listening. And this is basically saying, uh, get ready to listen and have a queue of size five. So if you get more than five requests that, has not been, that have not been processed, you can drop them. And finally, we start accepting requests. And this is when the, our process stops and waits for actual requests. And then once a request comes in, we get a client file descriptor. And this is basically a file. So that's the power of this abstraction of TCP is that it exposes simply a file descriptor, basically a file that we can write and read to, meaning send and receive data. And we can think of receive as reading data and write as sending data. And although the underlying network, the internet, is unreliable, so packets can get lost or what have you, the mechanics and the layer added by TCP ensures that we are protected from that and that we only have to care about reading and writing, basically sending and receiving data. So this might look like a lot for just creating a simple TCP or HTTP server, and you might think that in your favorite programming language, two lines of code suffice. Well, let's keep in mind that these are the actual syscalls and primitives offered by the operating system to establish TCP or UDP connections. So the bind, listen, uh, receive and send, there's also connect on the client side, are the Berkeley socket primitives or syscalls that any programming language needs to use in order to make use of the OS's networking capabilities. So I have opened the data we captured using TCP dump in Wireshark, and it looks like this. Mm, that looks inviting and very approachable. <laughs> it really is not that complicated. So if we Remember what happened is that we had our server listening on port 8080 and when we used Telnet to connect to it, we basically asked it to establish a TCP connection with that port. Since 
we did not specify any port. The OS picked one for us. And so this is our telnet program trying to establish a TCP connection with the TCP server. And let's back up for a second. Why do we need to establish connection? And why is TCP called connection oriented as opposed to UDP, which is the other transport layer protocol on top of IP that's not, that's connectionless? Well, as we said, TCP guarantees order. So if packets get lost or dropped and then retransmit it, we need some way to keep the order to know that I, re I already received that and I'm expecting that other packet in this uh, state is what the connection is used for. So we identify the two ends of the connection. You have the sender, uh, its IP, source IP and source port. And you have the destination, destination IP and destination port, and you identify that protocol. It's either TCP or UDP. So it's a 5-2 port. And by having that state, we can TCP can keep track of what's going on. And so we establish this connection using these first three messages. It's called three-way handshake so we send a uh, first packet with a sin flag and the tcp segments actually have uh, flags within them and flags is just uh, a bit to indicate some information about that segment so you can have a sin this is used to establish a connection you can have an acknowledgement we'll talk about that in a second you can have a fin and that's to indicate the termination of the connection and you can have other flags so the three-way handshake is uh, the sender that's telnet sends to the TCP server a sin. The server responds back, I acknowledge your uh, sin and I send you a sin back, meaning I want to establish a connection too. And then the telnet, the client, acknowledges the server sin and the two are have established the connection. And although we started out with a server and a client, the established connection is duplex, meaning it's bi-directional. Any party can send data and receive data, and you don't have to follow a request response model, but we can have data flow uh, in any direction whenever any one of the two processes this decides to send something. And so how does TCP provide reliability? How can we be sure that even if a, pa a data is a packet is lost or uh, corrupted, we will get it in the correct order. And the way to do that is uh, retransmission, meaning sending the packet again. But how do we keep track? Well, if we look at the segment, we see these uh, two values. The first one is the sequence number, and the other one is the acknowledgement. And the sequence number is basically the order or the number of the current byte. So I, ser I send the first segment. This is uh, sequence number zero. And then if in, the, if in that first segment I had a thousand byte, the second segment would have would start at uh, sequence number a thousand. And each time I send bytes, I increment my sequence number. So the receiver can see the sequence number and then know which packet it got and which it didn't. And based on the ones that actually garden it can send an acknowledgement number so an acknowledgement number is saying i received up to this sequence number and you send the next sequence number you're expecting so here we see the telnet is sending sequence zero and the server is responding with sequence zero meaning this is its first byte but it's acknowledging uh, the, the, the fir that first byte and sending uh, acknowledgement number one meaning it's expecting the next byte which is number one then the client sends sequence one, meaning it received that first uh, server byte, and it's expecting the next sequence byte number one. And it is starting at byte one. And then at some point we'll see that we are at sequence number 15, meaning that we already sent 15 bytes, and this is what we are sending next. And the server is gonna acknowledge 16, meaning it received up to 16. And at some point, if you remember, we said hi, we can see the high that we sent using telnet and the server responded with you sent high so it acknowledged it first then it responded back you sent high how is wireshark capable of understanding this stream of bits this stream of bytes because at the end of the day this is what it's reading how is it able to know what the source port is what the destination port is what, where the actual data is in the in the segment well that's the, the reason why we have protocols that's what tcp does it defines this format
So this is what all TCP segments look like. We have uh, a source port and it's 16 bits. And that's why we have 64,000 possible ports. Then we have a destination port, then a sequence and acknowledgement number. Then we have some flags, a window size, and some options. Uh, if we add some new uh, primitives or semantics, we can put them as options. And finally, we have the payload, the actual data. So any program or any operating system that has TCP libraries, it looks at the source port and destination port. And because the TCP segment is contained within IP packet, it also has the source IP and destination IP. And using this information, it can identify which process is using this connection and then pass along the segment. Another thing that TCP brings to the table is flow control. So what do we mean by that? So when you think about it, uh, Having this TCP connection between two computers, each one of them needs to store the data within the operating system before passing it to the application. So if you have an application that's getting uh, a million requests, the data needs to live, to live somewhere. And the somewhere is called a receive buffer. And so if at some point the, 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 uh, one of the TCP parties is overwhelmed and it's unable to keep up with the sender, it needs to signal that. And that's what this window field is all, is all about. So it's basically telling the other side how many more bytes it's willing to accept. And so if this win is equal to zero, it means that I'm all full, thank you, let me do some processing, and then I will let you know. And so this uh, ability to indicate how many bytes we're willing to accept is flow control and it uses this sliding window which is pretty cool there is another kind of window called congestion window so in addition to the receiver's limitations the network itself could be congested and we can overwhelm it if it's already clogged and we keep sending data making things worse so tcp baked in, has some congestion management and control baked into it and it basically tries to make sure that it does not overwhelm the network and that the moment packets start be getting too slow or being lost it means that there must be a problem somewhere and so it slows down on the other hand it has also this ability to keep increasing if packets uh, are uh, are being sent smoothly so it tries to make them to to make the most use of the network but back down the moment something bad starts to happen so as i previously mentioned http is nothing but a layer on top of tcp and so i have adjusted my tcp server to build a very basic uh, http server and we're going to try in full curve so whenever we get a request we simply return the most basic uh, HTTP response. We respond with uh, this body saying, I am a legit web server. So if I start the server and then I send a curl, this is basically an HTTP request, will I get that? And we are maintaining state in this uh, I variable that we are incrementing. If I send another request, I get two. And this is the most bare bones HTTP server, uh, actual HTTP server do a lot of things, but we get the idea. It's all built on top of TCP and the network reliability is handled by it.